Okay, my name is Kevin Amolsch. I'm the founder of Pine Financial Group. Uh, Pine Financial hosts this webinar each and every month. This is a live event. We do it right here at your computer, uh, 5.30 Mountain Time, the first Tuesday of every single month. Sometimes we'll do like a presentation where there's a PowerPoint and we go through a lesson. And sometimes we'll bring in great friends where we could deep dive into their careers, their successes and failures to help you as a real estate invest investor in your career and your success. And so today we have a fantastic guest, which I'm going to introduce in just a minute. Before I do that, I want to say thank you for joining us. You know, I, I know it's not a big financial commitment for you to be here. But it is a time commitment. And so Sean and I promise to do the absolute best that we can to bring you the value you're looking for. And I want to say this. I did talk to Sean right before we got on, right before we went live. And I said, Sean, are we cool going over a little bit if there's a lot of questions? Because I know there's going to be quite a few of you. I know it keeps adding. There's about 40 of you right now. And it, we see them uh, keep coming in. So please ask all the questions that you want right there in the question box. I'll have to lean up a little bit because my eyes are going bad. I'll catch the question. I'll ask Sean. So we'll do that until all the questions are answered. And I would like to say also, please ask anything. We're open books. Uh, we're here to help and uh, interact with everyone. So, so please don't hesitate to ask any question. It's no question silly. All also, right. I'm a webinar virgin. So <laughs> thanks for everyone coming to listen. My first time. All right. Who I am first, then we'll get into Sean. My name is Kevin Amolsch again. I'm the founder of Pine Financial Group. If you don't know, Pine Financial is a premier hard money lender in Colorado and Minnesota, and we are doing business in Wisconsin now as well. Um, we have two primary loans. The first one is a 100% rehab loan. That's where we loan all of your purchase, all of your repairs, all of your closing costs, everything up to 70% of the value. So if you're looking for a high leverage, no money down loan, give us a call. Our other loan, which is picking up a lot of steam, a lot of uh, popularity right now, it's a 90% acquisition loan. We can close in a day or two with no appraisal. So that's been pretty popular. Um, we're also doing a lot more commercial financing. So we've closed a couple in the last month. These are commercial bridge loans, very short term, fantastic for value add commercial deals, or if you just need a little bit of time before your permanent loan is in place. Um, so give us a call on your commercial financing needs. And then finally, before I introduce Sean, Pine Financial Group thinks highly and we value a lot you, the listener, our clients. Um, we believe that we're not successful if you're not. So that's why we do the free events, the free webinars, the blogs, uh, the newsletter, all of that. We're trying to add value to you. And if you give us a chance and uh, if we can earn your trust in business, we will add the value to you in your specific deal. So we would love the opportunity to work together. You can find us at pinefinancialgroup.com. Again, it's pinefinancialgroup.com. Sean. Great. Hi, everyone. You're, My name is... I was going to introduce sorry. you, buddy. I thought you were going to have me to introduce myself. <laughs> All right. No, this is... A, I'm going to have him tell you tell a little bit more about his story, but I want to introduce him quick. Sean is one of my closest friends. We're actually shooting this video in my living room right now. I think he walked over. He lives just a couple of doors down. Um, Sean, I've known you for about 20 years now, a little over 20 years. We've been doing business together for over 10. Mm -hmm. um, we're great friends. Our kids get along really well. In fact, your oldest daughter uh, babysits for us often. Uh, we're getting ready to go to Napa together. So I, I've seen your career from the beginning. I know you started out working for a national builder. I think there was a couple of national builders in there. Worked your way up through the ranks and decided to go out on your own fixing and flipping houses. And then you were able to scale that to be one of the most prolific developers in the Denver market. You were just on the news. Was that a month ago? I saw you on TV yeah. um, with, for one of your 50 plus unit projects in Denver University. So you've, or Denver University. Yeah, Denver University. Yeah, you. So you started out working in the grind like so many of our viewers have. And you worked your way up and scaling to de developing more than 100 units a year or at any given time, you yep. have more than 100 units going. So in this webinar, most of our listeners are, my guess is kind of starting out, maybe haven't done a deal yet, maybe one or two. So we wanna to try to lift them up, help them. So we're gonna to try to go back to right. like 10 years ago. I'll talk a little bit about what you're doing now, but mostly what can we do to help them be more successful uh, with what they're doing? So that was a fairly brief introduction, Sean, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Okay, great. My name is Sean Bookout, uh, co-founder of Dublin Development, real estate development group. Um, we started spring of 2008. 
starting with fix and flips, kept our full-time job. Uh, actually, let me back up prior to that. Um, so I've actually known Kevin 25 years. I was doing the math in my head while he was speaking. Um, I moved here from California, went to school, studied finance at Metro State, where Kevin actually, uh, we went together. Um, always loved real estate. Always did real estate specific projects when we had the opportunity. Uh, actually went to school with my best friend, Jay Edwards, which is my business partner. We cut our teeth um, in the business by learning what we, what we were doing in school and doing some projects on our own. Um, he went into commercial real estate. I went to construction management, cut my teeth at Richmond Homes as an assistant superintendent, learning the business, learning policies, procedures, um, quality control, how to build a house. Um, continued to grow, had an opportunity to move on with Century Communities as a front-end superintendent, project superintendent, moved on to a project manager, and then on to Trammell Crow doing four-story high-density mixed-use buildings. Um, while working, um, fast forward to 2008, working at Trammell Crow, we had the opportunity to do a flip. It was a bucket list thing. Uh, always liking real estate. We thought this is a great way to try it. Um, Kevin actually funded that deal for us back in 2008. Great success. We thought, wow, that went really smooth. Um, that, that has to be an outlier. Let's try it again. Did it again. Said, let's try a third. Did it again. Then we said, let's try a couple at a time. And we continued to grow from there. Um, in 2012, I was, again, we were working full time and doing flips on the side. So working 50 hours a week in the corporate setting, working 10 hours a week, flipping houses. And I was making to, to a point in 2012, making more flipping houses part time than I was making in a, in a career position, working 50 hours a week, high stress. So I was talking with yeah. Kevin, um, you know, Kevin's very positive. He's, he's by nature, a uh, entrepreneur he said go on your own what are you doing and i thought man i i just didn't want to let go of that that you know bi-weekly or, or bi-monthly paycheck um so kept thinking about it kept doing flips kept finding more flips um I had talked with kevin again kevin said and this sticks with me today oh yeah kevin said <laughs> okay as far as business let's say you, you have your own business you're on your own as far as business not in your personal life, but as far as business, what is your worst case scenario? Um, I said, wow, I guess my worst case scenario is having to go back to a nine to five. And he says, okay, you're doing a nine to five. So you're live business wise, career wise, you're living your worst case scenario. And right then it, it clicked. And uh, I thought I can always go back and get a, a career job. So right there, I, I talked to my wife, we prayed about it, put in my two week notice. And uh, never have not looked back. Um, so tell us where, where you're at today. What are you doing right now? So fast forward to today. Um, we are doing, we, we have two sides of our business. Uh, one side is high in single family scrapes in Wash Park, Corey Merrill, Bonnie Bray, Belcaro areas. Uh, These key, are all for people who, in Yeah, Denver. for people who don't know Denver, they're old, 100 year old key neighborhoods close to downtown Denver. Um, so a scrape, if you don't know, a scrape is you go and you buy an existing house. Um, say it's seven years old, scrape it, put a brand new house within zoning uh, regulations and, and put it back on the market. Uh, that's been a great at part of our business and, and Kevin has funded all of those deals. Um, so you're so that's half our business. recent one, so they can get an idea of how successful you really are. I know you're a super humble guy and this is difficult for you, but you sent me a text two days ago. Okay. What, what, what that, you okay, Sharon? Sharon? Uh, sure. Um, so I say this in a way to inspire, not to uh, be boastful, but um, we, we, we bought a house, we bought it for 500, we scraped it, bought the original house for 500, scraped it, built a brand new 5,500 square foot, uh, beautiful home, put it on the market, three weeks later, got it under contract. Um, we close in four weeks and we'll net about 600,000. Um, now a portion of that is, Actually, half that we're going to roll back into our business, but um, you know, six hundred thousand on on one deal, and that's not an outlier. That's you know, average single family deal will make three to seven hundred thousand on. Um, so that's exciting, and uh, it's all been because of slowly growing from flips to single family scrapes. So that's half our business is it's the single family scrape, key neighborhoods downtown Denver. The other half of our business is um, higher density. Um, condos mixed use again in Denver so 
that side of the business right now, we have a 53 unit and a 57 unit condo project, five story. One's at uh, DU, University of Denver, and the other one's uh, close, a little closer to downtown in the Jefferson Park neighborhood. So um, they're, they've been blessings, they're exciting, and that's what we're currently doing. Okay, fantastic. So, so many times I see real estate investors get into this business because there's a low barrier of entry, especially with someone like Pine Financial that could finance so much of the deal. Mm -hmm. so there's not a lot of, not a lot stopping you from entering it. And then you see A&E and Flip This House and all of these shows, right? So we have a lot of investors come in and only a few make it. Right. So there's grit here. You worked your ass off. I remember being worried about you, how much you were working when you were trying to go out on your own. What is it inside an investor that gives them that grit to just keep going and, and to, and to uh, mm. you know, work the long hours and the weekends and to actually quit their job and go full time and, and be able to be successful like you were? Well, I, that, that's a great question. There's a lot of components that go with that. Um, I mean, I can oversimplify it and maybe say about myself, um, you have to want it because nobody's going to believe in you if you can't believe in yourself and there's not a, a team there to support you. You have to want it and you have to dig in and you have to make it happen. Um, if you don't have money, like we didn't, you have to bring on constituents who do. So just like if you don't know how to frame, you're, you're not going to just try and frame. You're going to hire a framer. You're going to bring a capital partner. So it could be uh, Kevin with Pine Financial. It could be, borrowing money from an uncle for your down payment and then raising debt through a bank so you can get a construction loan. There's options, but a lot of people I hear say, man, I'd love to flip a house. Um, it seems so fun and I can be creative and design it. And I know this house on the corner and do it. That's great. Um, but people don't because they think, wow, I don't know where to start and I don't have money. Well, if you don't believe you can do it, you won't do it. But luckily, um, there are constituents out there that can help you do that. It's, I'm thinking of something that's kind Am of- Am I like oversimplifying this? No, I think but... that's great. I think it's great advice. Um, you just got to have that gut. You got to have it in your gut. Absolutely, right? yep. So you said uh, something that made me laugh and I hear it all the time is, well, it's fun, right? I get to pick out the tile color and the carpet and, and that's fun. Yeah. The most successful investors that I've seen, Sean, don't really design. I know you do some of that. You mm -hmm. guys design. But a lot of the guys that are turning these flips, you know, multiple, three, four, five a month, they do the same tile, the right, same right. carpet, the same paint color in every, they look all the same. Right. And that works. That works because what's, what's popular right now? Uh, 12 by 24 gray tile, um, gray cabinets or white cabinets, or now new, new things like a really dark blue cabinet. You find out what works, what people like, and you duplicate that. Um, mm -hmm. And you can do that. However, on a 1.8 to 2.9 million dollar house in Denver, you have to be a little bit more creative, a little bit more custom. And that's where the creative side comes in. Maybe not on the tile that you're picking for your backsplash in your kitchen, but the architectural style you're picking for the home. And that can be fun. It's fun for us. We enjoy that. And that helps That helps with the success. If you don't enjoy what you're doing, it's hard to dig in 50 hours a week. I'm going to get a couple questions here. Tony asks, sorry, we have to lean in because we got... Uh, my eyesight here, guys. So bear with me here. Is the three to seven hundred after all holding costs and interest? Is that your net? That is, yes. So that's so after net so after dirt. Um, this is how we would run it. Oversupply. You have dirt. You have um, soft costs. So design, permits, insurance, hard costs, bricks and sticks to build it, uh, real estate commissions, and your interest. So um, yeah, three to seven hundred thousand after the dust settles. Yeah, but I want to preface this or or explain this, make it more clear that you've been doing this a long time and you didn't start out making $300,000 no, a door. I no mean, way. No, this is not something that you should expect right out of the gate. I think your fix and flips, maybe we can go. To yeah, let's those. do that. So how, what's a, a typical fix and flip profit? Would you think, what does that look like? Okay. So our first fix and flip in Denver, um, 2008, we made 54,000. The second one, I'm going off memory here. The second one was like 38,000. Then we were back in the 40 range. The best flip we did in Denver was 89,000. That was after the dust settles. Um, and, and you would compare and say, okay, why would I do a flip to make this when I could do a scrape in Denver to do this? And you're right. 
one has substantially more profit. However, it has more risk. It might be an 18 month project from acquisition to sales. And now you're not selling a $300,000 house in Westminster, you're selling a $1.8 million house. Um, so your target market group for, for who you're trying to buy the house is gets much smaller. So there's more risk, more work, uh, longer time. Uh, but back to this gentleman's question, to Tony's question, um, in the examples of the high-end homes in downtown Denver, yeah, you, you can achieve those type of margins. Here's another thing. With my background in construction, we, we GC these in-house. So we're not hiring a third-party GC to come in who's charging us uh, market value on the hard cost plus general conditions and profit and all their fees. We're getting them at great pricing because we've used guys for 10, 10 years. Um, and we're, we're saving ourselves a lot of fees because we have one construction manager who's an employee who might have five to 10 houses at a time. So that cost for us is much lower than maybe somebody who doesn't have that background. Now, don't let that be a barrier to entry. It's all about bringing your strength to the table. Your strength, build that. Yeah, your strengths might be, uh, there, there's three parts to the deal to oversimplify. Uh, opportunity, capital, or execution. If we have the opportunity and we have the execution, we need the capital. But some somebody out there might have capital. Their strength might be capital. Build a team of people that know how to find opportunity and execute um, to to put a great deal together. Yeah, that's great advice. I mean, that's great. You know, the the three that you just said there. I think that's so smart because you can't do this alone, can you? You can't do this alone. So find out what you're great at. Learn every aspect of it. You know, learn if you're great at real estate, start learning about construction. Not that you're going to swing your hammer all day, but so that you can manage your general contractors. Or if you bring on a couple uh, construction managers, you can manage them. But if your strength is real estate, exploit that strength. Become an expert in that area. Okay. And then bring on the areas that you need. Just like hiring employees as we scale, we're going to talk about scaling today. It's bringing on people that have strengths that you might not have. Yep. It's more than just time. It might be a strength that you need. And I definitely want to get into finding deals. That's probably the most important question mm. I get or not most important. Yeah, maybe the most important. It's the most common question I get is how to find deals, but I'm not, I'm going to hold it off on that so that they wait until the end. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but I have a few more questions here. Um, okay. What are the credit requirements? So I think that's a question for me. So I'll come back. I'll just answer that real quick. There is none. Um, we could, if you file a bankruptcy yesterday and it's discharged, and you want to borrow money today, we will do that. If you're in the middle of the bankruptcy, that could cause us a problem because I don't want to get wrapped up in it. But if it's done, fine. Um, we care most about your success. So we're going to focus heavily on a quality deal. If you have a quality deal and a little bit of money in the bank to handle a problem, then we're going to find a way to work with you. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question, Lisa. Tom's got a question. What do you mean a scrape? I think Sean answered that. I'll just tell you that really quick, Tom, though. A scrape is when you take an existing home and you don't remodel it, but you you scrape it. You demo the whole house. Get so it's a house. raw lot and then you start over with a whatever a new project could be. It could be single family home, depending on your zoning. It could be a duplex. It could be, in some cases, what we've done in Denver um, are townhomes. So you have a single family home or a duplex. Zoning has changed. You scrape the old one off. You build a, a new project. Yeah. So I, I think of that as more, if you hear infill construction, it's like an already an established area and you're just building one or two little houses in that um, as opposed to building out a whole development. Right. Um, so that would be infill would be, but um, it doesn't necessarily need to be a scrape to be infill. So now I'm not probably confusing everyone. Well, no, but they, 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 with what we're doing, they, they're infill being their All he does existing lots or lots in Denver um, and then scrapes, you're scraping off the old stuff. All right, Thanks Blaine. Right. Blaine wants to know. Yeah, that's a great question. Blaine wants to know. Uh, I just had that. Uh, how do you find your contractors, Sean? Okay. Um, so Blaine, uh, I'm, I'm going to answer that two ways. For the stuff we're doing in house that we're self performing on, we've known guys all the way since I was working for Trammell Crow Residential Building, higher density stuff. Um, you meet guys along the way. Um, as far as the high density stuff we're currently building, where we hire GCs, we go out and hire um, larger GCs like Brinkman and Taylor Coors and Bristol Cone and and Katera to build a higher higher. What do you do? Go to Craigslist? I mean, where where, uh, where do they where do you find them? Um, yeah, I wouldn't do Craigslist. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've had some experience with that. I call him. Yeah. Uh, luckily, we just have a, a a whole stable of guys we've used for years. However, let's say you don't have 
a stable guys. Please don't go to Craigslist. I've heard horror stories. Um, look for a local GC with a good reputation, get references and start, start a small project with them and test them out. And, and if that works for you, great. If you want to GC it yourself, get your license and your insurance, which you can do, go through the process um, and, and, and hire guys yourself. That's great as well. Um, there's been success at Home Depot. Camp out at Home Depot on a Saturday. Oh, that's a good idea. Go to the tile section. Hey, gentlemen, are you tile guys? Hey, can I get your car? Go to the electrical section. That's a way of finding guys. That's a really interesting idea right there. Uh, spend a lot of time at Home Depot because you get to know material prices and they yeah. do like little classes and yep. Home Depot is a good resource. Yeah. Um, I I was halfway joking, but I'm being very serious when I said I get my contractors from you. And the reason I do that is because it's a referral. So I would say go to your RIAs and your um, networking events, your meetups, and ask other investors who they're using. I think that might right. be a great way to do it as right. well. Um, that's a great idea because you could ask people who's a good tile guy, and somebody in your in your group will know them. And they may, they may be good for a little while and then not so good. Yeah. So, I mean, I hope I don't offend any of our uh, listeners, our participants here, but contractors aren't always great. I mean, they, no. they will be for a little while and then – Sometimes you guys just wear your relationship out, right? And then you got to move move on. So you always right. be prepared to do that. What they say quick to hire, fast to fire. Right. Um, slow to hire. What I say? Slow. Uh, slow to hire, fast to fire. What he said. Um, and what we're talking about that. Let me interject also. One way to protect yourself, guys, in in regards to any contract, good contract or bad, is it all comes down to the money. They want to get paid. Once you pay them, they lost motivation to finish a job or come back and do warranty. So protect yourself with a good subcontractor agreement. Verify they have insurance. And if anybody ever asks for money up front, they're the wrong guy. You pay people when they're done with the work and you had an opportunity to, opportunity to verify it yourself, sign off on it, and then get it to your lender so they can come out and, and before they do a draw. What do you think about buying the materials for the subs instead of giving them yeah. money? Because the argument's always one no, materials. Right. So what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, buy your own material. That's that's a good point. Good idea. Um, but if they're buying the material, don't pay until they're done. Got it. All right. I think we have a bunch more here. Um, credit requirements, scrape. How do you find contractors? Thank you. Oh, I think Tony's asking. Hey, Tony. I think you want to know about how to find deals. So we're going to come back to that one. Uh, drop dead deadline for contractors and access to pen. Okay, so we're talking about late fees here. Those are really hard to enforce, but I'm, that's a good question. I'm excited to hear what you have to say about yeah. penalties and holding a contractor accountable. Um, I, the way we hold a contractor accountable is um, is money and, and holding that money until they're done and then paying that. Maybe they get a portion. Maybe they get uh, two thirds at completion and the last one third after you've had a time for some other subs to come in and and see how the project's wrapped up. But um, we've never accessed late penalties or liquidated damages. Um, so hard. Personally. It sounds good in the seminars, guys, but it's hard. To yeah, that's, that's hard. We have in our subcontractor agreement. Um, it's actually a pretty heavy-handed subcontractor agreement. However, we've never had to enforce it. If the sub is the wrong fit, they're the wrong fit. Luckily, you haven't overpaid them. Um, and you move on down the road with, and, and hopefully build relationships with new guys. But we've never had to had to do that, but I do appreciate that question. That's Blaine. a good one. So I want to interject real quick and tell me what you think about this one. So what I've had success with is asking the contractor, what time or when will you be done? Have them give me their date and then I'll add three, four, five right. working days on top of that and say, so you will be done by this, right? I'm giving you some extra time. And then we put it in the contract and said, I'm going to have to charge you penalties. If you go past this, this is your deadline that you inflicted on yourself. Right. And I make sure that they understand that there's a penalty in there but I've never had success actually enforcing it. Uh, I just want them to think I'm going to enforce that. Right. And, and in addition that you could add into the subcontract agreement to protect yourself, even though you would have that clause in there. Another one that we have is um, we reserve the right to fire you and hire another subcontractor in to finish your work for you with 24 hour notice. So if you're not there on a Monday, you're not there on a Tuesday, you're not taking the call on a Wednesday. Okay. Well, we'll be there Monday. Guess what? Next Monday, you're not there. We give you a 24 hour notice and then we go on with a new sub. Uh, we haven't had to do that a lot either, but that works and it protects us if they want to take legal action against us. We, we can show the contract. And that does happen. And that does happen. Unfortunately, especially yeah. when you get to this level. Right. Um, it does happen, uh, which we talk about that quite a bit, don't we? All right. Let's see if we can get here. Uh, how would someone uh, start out to build a scope of work? So when you're putting together your budget, 
Sean. Okay, so let's say, let's go back to your days of fixing and flipping. And you're going out into the field. You, I assume you have a notepad in your hand and mm -hmm. a pen in your other hand. Yep. And you walk into the house. Walk me through. What's your, what's okay, your so you're going to walk in. You're going to write. You're going to write a subconscious, or excuse me, you're going to write a scope org for yourself. You're going to walk into the house and you're going to say, what do I need to do to this house to get it from where it is now to where it needs to be to get the price point I need to, to meet or exceed the comps in the neighborhood? Um, so if I walk into a home when we're doing flips, um, it was always kitchen, baths, and, the, and I'll go through that in a moment. Kitchens, bath, look at the furnace, look at the water here, look at the roof, look at the windows, look at the foundation. Um, we have existing hardwood floor under the carpet. Great. Let's pull the carpet. Um, and I'm going to come up with a scope of work of what needs to be done. And then with each scope of work. So for example, let's take kitchen. If kitchen is, is a task, well, we have, what do we have in there? We have to, maybe we run a new gas line because we want a gas range. We need a, um, a brand new 220. Maybe the one's bad or freight. So we're going to put a new 220 for the uh, electric range cabinets, countertops, and, and all the subcontractors that come across that. When I would take that kitchen, I would break down into the sub responsible. So kitchen backsplash, well, maybe my countertop guy also does tile. So that's, for my tile guy, that's a scope for him. So the scope of the full project for myself and for my lender, but then there's a scope for each sub, and you could break that down. And if, if, if you're asking um, well, uh, Douglas, if you're asking that Douglas for your with your subcontractor scope work for your subcontractor, that's what what it would be breaking down the individual. If it's for your lender, it's the whole tasks, the scope for the project. Yeah, I, I love how he says he goes into the specific rooms. That's how I've learned to do a scope of work also. And if you guys are looking for a scope of work, we provide the spreadsheet to you for free mm -hmm. on our website. So it's pinefinancialgroup.com. Click on free resources, the SOW for the scope of work. And then it, it'll kind of help you break down the line items that we look at when we go into a property. Um, but yeah, when you when you walk around the house, you walk in, you said windows, uh, that one caught my ear. So how do we know if we need to replace windows? That's just an example, but anything in the house, right? How do we know we need to replace these tile granite countertops? How do we know we need to replace the windows or or anything in the house? What do you, you go look at the comps in the area? Or? Yeah, that's a tough one. I really, it's what do you want to achieve, but also what needs to be done. So if your comps all have brand new double pane windows and you're flipping a 70 year old house with single pane um, metal frame windows, that might be on your list. If everything in trading in the neighborhood is original windows and you don't have any cracked windows or maybe do a reglaze, leave the windows alone. If your windows, I'm sorry, if your roof is five years old, in good shape, leave it alone. Um, replace the stuff you need to replace. But then, and what we always have done is the kitchens and bathrooms are always bad, and that's what people see. Front door, we'd always put in a brand new front door. Clean threshold, paint it, paint it a beautiful color. Um, door, door hardware, if you want to keep your original doors, replace all the hinges, the door hardware, things like that that, that really clean up a house. Inexpensive, add yeah, a lot cheap. of value. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think you want, that you're, you're really trying to ha accomplish one of two goals when you're fixing and flipping for the exit, for the resale. You either want to come in a little bit better than your competition, or you're going to be priced a little bit better than your competition. So I think it's essential to go out and look at other listings in your area or look at the photos of other sold comps. We have, we all have MLS access now with Redfin and Zillow. Mm -hmm. So we could see the photos of our competition right online. Right. Um, okay. That was a good question. Where, where was that? I mean, you're much better. Um, oh, so I think we're on Aaron here. Uh, any recommendations on tips of how to execute an investment business? Am I reading that right? Business as far as tax purposes. Do you use an attorney, CPA, or EA? Do you use LLCs? Um, so, and what state? Um, I would be very careful with what state until you get pretty high level because there's some risks doing like the Delaware or the Nevada corporations. You hear a lot about that. There is some asset protection uh, with that, but there's more hassle than not because you could screw it up and have no asset protection. Um, sorry to go off on a little rant there, but what do you think about business structure? What do you guys use? Um, we use LLCs for everything. Um, some are, are single-use LLCs for a project, and, and, and most of the time they're in fact. Um, we have a great attorney, Jared Seidenberg, and Chris Kinsman, and then we have a CPA. So um, that's one thing as you grow. When we were, you know, 10 years ago, we, we got a very basic jail policy and didn't 
quite weren't as quite as savvy as we grew. We realized you need a good attorney, good CPA, um, and you don't realize how bad you need them until you need them, and by yeah. then it's too late. Um, so if you're starting off on a tight budget with your first flip, um, do set up an LLC, uh, hire an attorney if you would like to help you make sure you do everything good in the beginning. And then as you grow, you're going to engage them more to help you grow to make sure you're doing it safely. Yeah. And so for taxes, that was another, uh, looks like a point that he really wanted to get to is the taxes. Um, neither one of us are mm-hmm. tax professionals. So I think a CPA would be a yeah. fantastic team member for you to Absolutely. have. Absolutely. Yep. We now have a bookkeeper in house and then, um, Everything goes to our CPA monthly. All right, great question. That was Aaron. Okay, so Linda wants to know how long do you do flipping before you going into scraping business? Do you still do flipping? So how long were you fixing and flipping before you started your first? Before you did your first scrape, I think is what she's asking. Um, okay, Linda, that's a good question. So I'll tell you what we did. We started. Uh, flipping in 2008, we did our first scrape 2013 um, on our own. But really, it's it's what you're comfortable with, what your strengths are, and what the market is doing. It, um, we currently don't do flips because we have our hands full with scrapes and and larger projects, which we love doing and growing our business in that sense. But we would still do flips. I mean, if we found the right opportunity and and could just fight with taking one of our team members to manage a series of flips, we would still do flips. Um, but with you, if, if you do two flips, three flips and you feel comfortable and you, and you have a GC you trust and you want to try a scrape, try a scrape. Just make sure you have the right team around you um, before you start that. So it's scary to do a scrape because it's so much different, right? You got to have, your, you yeah. gotta have your, uh, you got to have your, uh, planning in place and you got to have your architecturals and your engineer involved and you got to get everything approved right and there's a process there at the city so how do you i mean how does someone that has never done that what do they do uh i would say experience but start with flips flips are great and maybe do flips for the next 30 years flips are great um but it's it's based on your comfort level i i would hate to tell you do 40 flips before you try a scrape and you miss out on an opportunity Maybe you have great opportunity and you learn fast and you have a great GC and maybe you do five flips before you jump into that scrape. However, the scrape is a lot more intense. You're looking at phase one environmental, soils reports, architectural, structurals, mechanical engineering, um, larger permit fees, and then a you know 12 month, eight to 12 month build cycle. Um, and and not to mention you know you're signing on a much larger loan, so you hope that you can sell it and and meet your commitments with your lender and still there's money left for you. Okay, so this might be crazy, and I apologize if you don't want me to say this, but I'm just curious now. Would you ever partner with somebody if they brought you a deal, or are you just so focused on your own stuff right now? Um, potentially, yeah. It'd have to be the right fit, the right opportunity. Um, there's a lot of ways you can skin a cat. So uh, I guess a, a general answer is yes. We would we would definitely partner with somebody, but given the right the right fit and the the yeah, right be a pretty profitable deal for you i probably shouldn't have brought yeah. that up no no it's okay no um we have people approach us and it just has to be the right person the right fit um the right opportunity what value what what is the value and how do you structure that at the end of the day how you divvy that up is it subordinating dirt or is it just finding a deal and wholesaling it um so there, yeah there's a lot of ways to to evaluate that okay we have quite a few more questions here but i want to ask i want to get to this finding deal since it's such a popular question um, now you have to i, I kind of i guess two parts here i want you to a- answer how were you finding your fix and flips you're making eighty thousand dollars on a door which is not that easy to do um and then now how are you finding deals so let's start with your fix and flips mm-hmm. when you were doing that how do you even find those so we were lucky at the time uh, that was 2008 when the market was a little bit different um the bank would actually put deals on on the mls um the real estate listings and they'd want 120 grand for a house in a neighborhood where houses were selling for 200 and we say great we want the house but we can only offer 80 and the banks would say great when can you close so probably our first 10 deals were similar scenario then the market started to clean up in denver and deals got a little tough the margins built yeah um there's still deals out there and it's like that not just in denver i know he's ingrained here yeah, I'm, a, but yeah I'm a denver guy we have a national audience here so i know minnesota that market pretty well too 
and it's very similar to here. So it's tougher now. It's a little tougher, um, but there's still deals out there. So what would, what would they do? Where should they go? Um, okay, great. So there's a lot of ways to do this. There's the old fashioned way of knocking on doors, mailing campaign. Okay, let's stop there. Knocking on doors. What door do I knock on? Uh, if there's a neighborhood you like, do you think there's opportunity there? Start knocking on doors. Introduce yourself, what you would like to do. Are you interested in selling? Here's what I can do for you. I can, um, and this is a strategy we, we use. Um, I don't have a realtor or a friend's a realtor who can do this at a discount. So we can waive real estate commissions or nominal real estate commissions. So you're saving money there. Also, I'm going to waive inspections. I want to do an inspection, but I'm waiving that as a as an out because I'm going to I'm going to scrape your house or I'm going to uh, severely you remodel. remodel your house. I don't care if you have a 30 year old uh, uh, furnace um, or a yucky kitchen. Don't tell them yucky, but yeah, <laughs> you know. So I'm going to waive inspections and I'm going to waive real estate commissions. That gets a lot of buyers perked up, and um, that's how, what we currently use as as a strategy. Now you can do that. You can advertise that to them by knocking on doors. And it still works. So you just go to a neighborhood, you, like not a yeah. foreclosure list or a yeah. tent, like I'm not going to try to find I, I talked to a friend um, the end of last week who his name's is Doran. Um, he put together a four house deal, four houses in a row in assemblage in Jefferson Park, hot neighborhood in Denver on 25th Street. He put this assemblage together by knocking on doors the old fashioned way. And now he's going to build 30 condos. Um, so it works as a fix. And it works too. This guy's an experienced developer and he put together this deal. So if someone's out driving neighborhoods, like they're looking for signs of motivation and they see an overgrown yard, you're saying just get out and knock on the yeah. door? And if nobody answers, check public records. Um, that could be an opportunity there. Okay. And so talk to him, but okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. Door knocking, mailing campaign, mailing. Okay. very similar. And here's another thing. We get people that will call us from a mailing campaign we did two years ago, and they saved our letter because they weren't ready to sell. And they call us up two years later and say, hey, I got your letter two years ago. Uh, I'm moving to New York or I'm downsizing or whatever, and I'm interested in selling. And we say, great, let, let's revisit your property and see if we can put something together. So that works as well. In fairness to Sean, I know Jay and his office handles – the heavy lifting on yep. a deal acquisition. So he handles this bit of yep. it. But um, so who do we mail? If you know, who do, who do you guys mail to to find a, or who would you uh, check on public records on who the owner is? So it could be a, rent, a renter in the home. So you'd find out who the actual owner is and you'd mail to their property. Maybe they're out of state. Maybe they're in another town. Is that your question? Well, I mean, do you have a list? It, like, is there a good oh, list? That you've oh, had okay. I'm sorry. With? No, we drive uh, Jay, my business partner. Um, we'll drive neighborhoods. So we won't send out a sweeping thousand letters to one neighborhood because half of those are scraped already or or whatever the case may be. He'll get out there. Sometimes we'll just gather, but a lot of times he'll just get out there and he'll drive a street and look and like Kevin said, if there's a rundown looking house, he'll write it down. Gets the next one, hey, that's a 70-year-old house. Nobody's done work on it. Let me write that number down. And and then it's a little more specific to to those addresses. So we're not. So he's looking for. So when he was fixing and flipping, so that everyone understands this, you weren't really knocking on doors and sending out mailing so much. Mostly, mostly it was through the MLS at that point. It was through the MLS at that now, point. Now, yeah. now it's more off market mm -hmm. type of. So for you trying to fix and flip, if that's what you're looking for, what I have other clients having some success with is probates and free and clear properties. Those are the two top lists that are performing that I see from my experience right now. So probates and free and clear. And you can get those from a list broker like list listsource.com is one example. But if you just Google list broker, um, they'll be able to help you with uh, narrowing down a list to mail to. And then you got to hammer them, you guys. You got to hammer them five, seven mailings before you'll get a response. And your response is still going to be probably less than 5%. So it takes a lot of work, but there are deals out there. I don't want to discourage you. Now, I know Jay's really good at this, but tell me, talk a little bit about the follow-up. So do you, once you get a call and I know Jay just hammers. Yeah, them. Jay follows up and says, this is who we are and this is what we like to do. Uh, we're going to waive real estate commissions. We're going to also waive inspections because we're going to, we're going to dim your home. And I know that seems like, yeah, of course, that's what we're doing. Why wouldn't you advertise that? However, a lot of our competitors don't. Tell them that they use that as a strategy to get money off the price of the house. So they'll say, "Yeah, we'll pay you four hundred thousand And then a month later, they say, "Wow, you've got a bad sewer," and blah 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 blah. We want fifty grand off the house. Uh, we don't do that strategy. Uh, we put our best foot forward. 
Um, so Jay is great with that follow up on the acquisition side. He just keeps calling them Call over and over. Yeah. Um, going Very back good. to some ideas on how to find yeah, it. Yeah, let's keep going. Um, develop a relationship with a good wholesaler. Um, if, for those of you that, that don't know, you can meet these through your local real estate group. What a wholesaler is, is they might not have the knowledge and ability to execute on a project. They might not have the money. Um, they might not want to wait eight months, 12 months on a deal, but they're great at finding deals. Um, find one that can find good deals that you can build a, a trusting friendship relationship, business relationship with that's not trying to tack 40 grand on a house. Um, but wants a fair fee and build that relationship. And that's a great way to find properties. Um, another great way. Um, I have a friend named Nathan that we've used for, I've known him six years. He's brought us a lot of our deals. He's a, he's a, a top Denver realtor. He knows how to find deals and he will give us a call and say, Hey, I found this opportunity that work for you guys. That's another great way to find opportunities. So, so, so wholesalers, realtors, um, like Kevin said, uh, uh, free and clear houses, probate, um, and there's MLS. Others. There's others, yeah. But, you know, we see a lot of bandit signs, you know, the little signs we buy houses. So yeah. it's work pretty well too, but you got to be consistent or it doesn't work. You can't put up signs one weekend and expect to close a deal. Um, the wholesalers, you know, Justin in our office has compiled a list of wholesalers. Now we can't say one's better than another or anything, but if you want a list of wholesalers in either Minneapolis or Denver, I think he's got both lists. I, not positive, but I, I'm pretty sure he's got both lists. So if you want a list of wholesalers, email Justin. Uh, he'll love it. Uh, it's just Justin at pinefinancialgroup.com. Say wholesale list. Kevin told me to call you or email you. Right. All right. So are we good with the finding yeah, deals? Let me, or? Let me and I don't mean to drag out, but let me add this one part um, because Kevin brought that up. A lot of times I still rely on Kevin. So if I've got a question about something, I'll call Kevin and Kevin says, Oh yeah, I've experienced that before. Or Justin in my office or Travis in my office might know. Or, hey, I don't know, but I know this guy and you can talk to the idea. So so Kevin is a great resource and his team's a great resource for answering a lot of things. If you're trying to get into this for the first time, they're going to steer you in the right direction for success. Okay, thank you. All right, where were we at, Sean? I think, uh, so we got Linda, I think we're on set there. Okay, people get some knowledge. Oh, bigger pockets, also the Pine Financial Events and YouTube channels suggestions okay thank you seth you're right so gosh darn i'm glad you brought up the youtube channel you know we've been putting in a lot of effort to put produce high quality good content videos short like five eight minute type of videos every single week so we would love it if you guys went to the youtube channel and subscribe to that it's just youtube i think it's backslash pine financial or you could search Pine Financial on the YouTube channel. We bring in people like Sean. Uh, he hasn't participated quite yet. We're doing a much longer version with him tonight. But um, uh, yeah, YouTube, Pine Financial, hit subscribe. We would love it. Thank you, Seth, for that. Um, Tony asks if you use lien waivers. So first, if you could explain what a lien is, what Tony is referring to, right. and how do you protect yourself? Okay. So in Colorado, and it's different around the country, but um, if a if if I overpay a subcontractor um, or a payment advance and they didn't do a good job, I have to actually file a lawsuit against them. If they don't get paid, they can file a lien against the property for um, whatever they're not being paid for. So for say, anything. Say, yeah. Well, yeah. It's kind of liberal here in in Colorado with that, and it uh, it's it's become an issue. So if somebody thinks that, oh well, I wanted to charge you more. And even though the subcontractor agreement says I can't charge you more without written approval, I'm going to charge you more anyway. And if you don't pay me, I'm put a lien on your property. There's ways to handle that. Um, you can actually file a, a suit against them. And if they're proven to be fraudulent or not within the contract, they have to pay triple, you have to pay you triple the amount. I believe it's triple the amount. I want to misspeak. Um, luckily we haven't had to do that because once you bring that in a, up to in a lien waiver, they drop it. But lien waivers, yes, we do lien waivers. There's two ways to do it. And there's two ways we do it. We stamp the back of a check. It's a gem, general boilerplate when lean waiver. And then when, and that says, hey, in the memo, this is the address. This is what you did. Tile complete, labor material, tile complete, stamp a lean waiver. And then we have to actually sign a copy. If you're doing, um, there's a title company out here that we use all of our, through our title work, it's land title. If they're distributing the draws for the bank and for us, they actually have a lien waiver that's got to be signed also um, in, eject, in, in uh, conjunction with the checks. Um, so yeah, I love we, how you, you 
I didn't see I'm developing a 13 unit right now and I'm writing all my own checks for this and I stamp all the lien waivers, but I didn't think about putting on the front of the check what you're paying for. That's very smart. Yeah, uh, over document it. Yeah. You can call it if you have a contract with your sub, which you should, that says payment one is uh, uh, payment one is bathroom tile, payment two is kitchen tile, payment three, whatever. Uh, you can write it on there the address, tile, labor material, payment number three per the call, whatever. And well, that maybe just helps. The invoice number. Invoice or number, yeah. Yeah, that's smart. The last one I always do is paid in full. I put in the memo, the address, labor material, paid in full, and then the lien waiver. That way in two months if they decide, well, I want to put a lien on there because I feel like I, this guy's making a lot of money. I want to I want to put my, my hand in his pocket. I'm going to put a lien on there. You could say, or well, if there's a dispute on another project in the future, yeah, that one they still can't lean sold another. Yet. Correct. Yeah. Yep. That's so smart. So I'm glad that you asked that, Tony. Thank you. Tony, good job, Tony. Uh, do you only offer financing for properties in Colorado? So, Elisa, we offer financing for Colorado, Minnesota, and parts of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, so, in Minnesota, we're all throughout the Twin Cities and in Rochester. Um, and then in Wisconsin, we're right across the border from the cities and in Milwaukee. Good question, Lisa. Uh, Tony has another one. I heard that if you buy the material and a contractor get hurt or gets hurt, using those materials, you could be liable. Ooh, that's a good one. And also they don't warranty it if you buy them. They don't war warranty the material if you buy the material. They will warranty it if they buy it. So how do you address Tony's well, question there? Um, that's a that's a really that's a good, one. good question. And I don't know the details on that. Um, from what I know, if somebody gets hurt, Tony, um, it can go back to the owner, the property owner. So this is how we protect ourselves. Subcontract agreement, have everybody sign it. In the subcontractor agreement, you're requiring in there that they have GL insurance with, with certain limits that are gonna be dictated by your, your company, uh, your GL insurance uh, provider rather. Um, and then uh, workman's comp, they have to have workman's comp. If they don't have workman's comp, we have a, a, a policy that from our, our company, our insurance company, and it's a waiver. So they have to fill it out saying they're waiving their rights um, to workman's comp and that they can't come after you if there's an injury because they're a working professional that's getting paid to do a job and they know as an adult working professional that they're responsible for themselves. Get it notarized, you put that in the house file. You don't ever want anyone to get hurt. You want to be conscious to make sure your job site is safe and protected and with in OSHA standards. But if somebody gets hurt, you don't want them blaming it on you. Um, so that's one, that's how we protect ourselves is through GL workman's comp uh, requirements. Every sub has to have it because that one sub that doesn't happen that gets hurt and you're in a two hundred thousand dollar lawsuit doesn't doesn't feel good when you're doing a flip. That's a great question and a great answer. Oh, you know, a lot of times you could um, they can go pick up the material, use order it all with Home Depot, right? They can go pick it up and then they call you and you give them the credit card right over the phone. Uh, I don't know if that changes yeah. anything, but I've seen that quite a bit. Well, in, in, in uh, so I don't want to misspeak, but. In Colorado, if somebody gets hurt on your job site, they can go after the property owner, not even the contractor. So you hire a contractor. Yeah, whether they bought the material or not. Yeah. So you hire a general contractor. Your general contractor forgets to put handrails up at your stairs. Your tile guy falls off the stairs. They can put a. Uh, they can sue the property owner. Um, so it goes back to get an LLC in place, get an attorney to make sure things are done right, write a contract, uh, subcontractor agreement, get all your insurance. But also talk to your GC and make sure everything's being collected and you are additionally insured on that their policy. Um, and go out to the site and make sure it's safe. And, and even if you don't know site safety, make sure your GC is telling everyone OSHA standards, OSHA regulations, so that everyone is safe. Okay, so we're going to try to pick up the pace here a little bit to make okay, sure we get through all the this. questions. We'll go we through have a, about 10 minutes. I have some questions that I would like to ask. Okay. Sean's dying to answer them. You all have some questions that you want Sean to answer. So let's get through this. We talked about scaling this business. That's what I, when I put out the emails to everybody, mm -hmm. I'm like, how do you scale the business? What I'm talking about here is how do you go from one flip to two? How do you go from two to 20 or to a hundred? What is your advice there? Okay. With scaling. So, um, if this is something you want to do, you're finding success in it, you want to grow, grow. You can do it. What are the tools they Wear need? as many hats as you have to wear at first. Um, you're going to wear a lot of hats, and you might work 50 hours a week, but it's worth it as you're developing your skill and building your reputation and making money. Wear a lot of hats. 
um, where you don't have a hat, have constituents around you that might not be employees, but because you interact with them a lot, it's like having an employee or a business partner. That's going to help you grow. Um, so let's look at a few in, a few things you need to grow. First of all, you need continued opportunity. So great, you did 10 flips. Before you hire an employee or you, do you know you have another 10 to 20 to 30 in front of you, you have to have opportunity. Second, real estate investment, real estate development is a very cash intense business. Um, part of that is, is earnest money and covering interest payments and covering overages and construction, which can happen. But part of that is operating costs and overhead if, if you're hiring employees. So make sure you have cash or a business partner or a capital partner that believes in you. And that's part of the relationship, part of the structure is they're going to bring in the money. You're going to hire and manage the team. Okay. Next policies and policies and procedures. When we started doing flips and it was a notepad, that was great. And it was a cell phone. And, and frankly, we still do that in the field. But as we got more sophisticated, we realized we had to develop subcontract agreements and scope of works and lien waivers and um, Excel schedules that we could email out to our crews and quality control punch lists. And when we find a deal, we need a, a list that, so we can vet that property and pro forma us. Um, so policies and procedures you have to put in place because if you can't be organized and, and follow your own rules that you, you've set, you can't manage employees because they it'd be like herding cats. Uh, if you can set together policies and procedures that you enforce for yourself, then you can share that with your team. So that's part of growing. Um, what else for scaling? That's good. I would I say think that's, while you're thinking about it, I, I'd add, add this. I think people are going to be the most important for you to scale. And you've mentioned that here too. I mean, you know, your partner, Jay, and how you've mm -hmm. hired a team and you manage them with the, the policies that you have in place. Um, I think your first hire should be some type of administration assistant and yeah, an admin. Um, so you could delegate as much as possible so that you could do high paying work. I, that's great advice. So that's the first hire. And then the next two, three, four hires should probably be performance based or heavily incented so that it's not costing you a lot of money to have them on your team. But if they perform, they make you a lot of money. So that would be my that's, advice. That's great. Yep. Um, admin's huge. I remember Nathan, um, my friend Nathan, that's helped mentor us through this growing process over the last five, six years. Um, he, I said, when do you know your first hire? And he said exactly the same thing. He said, I knew I needed to hire somebody that I could trust and, and help grow in the company when I realized I was spending half my day doing admin and sending out envelope or send out letters and envelopes. And, and right. he said, when I was caught myself doing that all day, I realized I needed help with that so that I could focus on finding opportunities and building banking relationships, et cetera. Yep. Okay. So I'm glad that you said that. Yeah. So your um, first hire should be, should be, um, admin position, maybe a little part-time admin. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Hire the right people. Like, like Kevin said, slow to hire, quick to fire. And that is true. And we've experienced that. But outsource as much as you can yep. first. So your your bookkeeping and your mm -hmm. subcontractors, for right. example. I mean, you have you have construction crews now and you have right. uh, a superintendent that goes out and it's on your payroll. But at the beginning, you just want to sub it all out. Yeah. And and I was in a lucky position because uh, my business partner, um, it's it's a lot easier to saddle the responsibility and the stress when you have somebody to share it with. So That's it good. wasn't me and an employee, it was me and a business partner. So we were vested and we believed in each other and we believed in Denver and we believed in where we could grow to. But he he had responsibilities and I had responsibilities and, and it really satisfied the need of, of even having an employee. In fact, we we didn't do our first hire until probably three years ago. For seven years, we were just us running and gunning. But you don't need a partner. So, I, I mean, you and well, I disagree a little on this. Yeah. But um, partners you know, can you be talked tricky. about your mastermind group right before we jumped on. We, we were just yeah. talking, waiting for the time. And I was like, ah, you still meet with the, one of our other buddies named Steve. You still meet with Steve. And we started talking about that. But maybe real briefly, talk about this mastermind. And is that something that that our viewers can – can create or join for some accountability and someone that they can complain to. And yes, absolutely. And tell us about, absolutely. About that. Surround yourself with people that you can trust, people that are positive, um, and people that that believe in you and believe in like where you want to be. Group that you a meet. group, yeah. You meet every single month. We meet once a month. Uh, we do, we don't have any deals together. We're just fellow real estate developers with years of experience, and we get together once a month for a four hour session, and we. 
we line it out. We bring something. Let's, hey, I read this article last month. Let's review this article as a team. Hey, I got this deal I'm looking at. What do you guys think? I'm really stuck on this deal. Hey, I've got this problem with the subcontractor. Uh, Denver zoning's changed in this neighborhood. How do you guys want to tackle this, or what would you do? And uh, it's been great. And something to lean on. And because look, yep. it's a lonely business. There's no question. But if you can create little groups and rias and, and and things like this, it could be really fun too. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. If you don't have a business partner. You need this. And if you do have a business partner, you still need this. So, <laughs> yeah, surround yourself with positive, um, positive, driven, confident, like minded people. Um, All right. Yeah. Good. So, we're, it looks like we've lost a few. There's still quite a few of you on here. So, let's, uh, let's cruise through these questions. So, you guys, we're going to stay here until every single question is answered. So, you can start loading this up now and we're going to do our best to read it. I wonder if we, oh, dude, we can highlight it. Okay. Be much easier to keep track. Oh, I just screwed that up. I was got so excited. All right, Tony says thank you. Blaine says, oh, I think we skipped one. No, I didn't. Oh, we were way down here, aren't we? Where are we? Okay, Scope how works, so we work? pass that one. Any Aaron Smith, any recommendations? All right, sorry that. guys, I screwed up our questions here. There's how do you quite a few in here. Before going scraping. And I think what is this one? We did that one. Suggestions, which people get. Okay, so bit bigger pockets. Okay, thank you. Lean waivers. Only Colorado. Okay, we did that one. Yeah, we. How do you get a GC estimate? I'm looking at a fourplex that needs a full gut rehab. Hmm. You don't want to be uh, off on the numbers. Do you need to get the property under contract first? What do you think? Thanks in advance, Wes. Wes, great question. Um, if you're going to spend money, then you need to get it under contract or pre, be pretty darn close. If you want to get in there, uh, if there's going to be a sh you can set up a showing and get a, two GCs in there to put numbers together. Uh, great. Don't get it under contract yet. You don't want to get it under contract, get ready to put down a reservation or, or uh, your earnest money and find out it's uh, twice your budget and the deal doesn't work. Um, also talk to if you if, you know constituents or real estate groups or whatever about reputable GCs that you can meet over there so you know that a the guy's going to give you a fair price but also he's going to be able to execute on that contract. Um, but yeah, don't put money down or get it under contract until you know it's a deal. Constituents, you've said that several times. I've never heard you say that before. Constituents, yeah. So that's uh, a tough word. Constituents would be. Uh, I'm sure they have non-employees. Maybe I'll just tell you. Yeah, know what they Kevin's a constituent. Uh, all right, uh, our attorney, our, uh, our realtor. Um, so I think he's looking a little bit more for like, how do you get the, the estimate? So do you get it under contract first and then go to the contractor? Do you risk wasting the contractor's time and bring him into houses you're looking at before you offer on it? What's the process there? Yeah, I don't worry about wasting the contractor's time. They're in the business of, of getting your business and then, and then executing on that contract. If you have an opportunity to get into a house and spend an hour looking at it, walk with your contractor. And, and you'll learn to be able to estimate a lot of things yourself as, yeah. you, as you become more experienced. I don't know your experience level, but you'll get better at estimating yourself where you don't need to meet your GC over there. And then if he says, hey, it's going to cost 50 grand, and you said, great, that fits in the numbers, um, now I'm going to get it under contract. Or, or option B is you get it under contract and get a free look. So yeah. you say, hey. That's what I would do. It works. Because you, know, you have to make so many offers to get one. Yeah, so. this deal works for me. I need a I need a four day free look. At four days, I put my my uh, uh, earnest money down, or I'm going to put half of my earnest money down now, and the remaining half at four days refundable. Yeah, um, just make sure the earnest money is refundable. Yeah, you get your and get a free look. Number, and if you're going to use hard money or private money, make sure that they get a chance to look at the numbers before that earnest money goes hard. Right. Um, but yeah, I like what he's he's saying. Don't worry about wasting their time. They're in a business to give um, bids, and you don't want to waste your time either. So I would try to hard to get a deal under contract before you spend too much time uh, walking projects right. with contractors. So um, anything else on that nope. one? Nope. Okay. Good job, Wes. And Wes, if we didn't answer answer it exactly how you were looking, resend us another question. It, it and if we did answer it, you know, great. All right, Blaine says, do you use an LSE for each project? Do you use land trusts? Never use the land trust. Um, we use a single-use LLC for every large project. 
um, townhome, multifamily type projects. Everything has its own LLC, bank account, insurance, everything. Um, single family, we typically will have our single family under um, one LLC. So if we have eight single family in the neighborhood, it will all be under one LLC. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll jump in real quick because I, I know a little bit about this. Um, the land trust, the reason uh, Sean doesn't use it is because he doesn't hold a lot of properties right now. He's flipping them and selling them. Uh, land trusts work great to hide identity, but it offers zero asset protection. And it can create a problem when you sell the property mm. um, because the checks from the title company will have to go to the trust. And it's actually pretty rare to set up a separate bank account for a trust. Um, so they work great if you're going to hold them long term to hide the identity, but you still want to use an LLC as a beneficiary of the trust or the owner of the property. So absolutely, LLCs are the best. The thing about the LLC that's so great is that it could be taxed any way you want. You could tax it as nothing if it's a single member LLC. You could tax it as a partnership and have K-1s distributed to the partners. Uh, or you could tax it as an S corporation. And you want to do that if you start making a lot of money to eliminate some self-employment tax. So I'm not a CPA, definitely getting your CPA involved, but good question. You use a single LLC, a throwaway company for the large projects. Otherwise you just kind of divide it up between LLCs. Right. And you do that because of the ease of business is what I'm hearing. Yeah, exactly. You know, we don't, we don't want 40 LLCs, right. but maybe 10 is manageable. Right. Okay, good question. I think also if I may, uh, Kevin, uh, Jared Seidenberg spoke to this, I think, on your last webinar talking about LLCs. And yeah, he was in one of the short videos. Or video, yeah, short yep, video. So, yep. See, he's I, on the YouTube that's channel. That's probably on YouTube, and he talks about you know, the pros and cons of that. Yeah, but that's good. You definitely want to stock, start talking to somebody about an LLC. Okay, that was Blaine. Jennifer asked, how long will it take to scrape from beginning to finish with like – so? From she says through the sale, so acquisition mm. to when you sell the property, what's the timeline? Uh, Jennifer, it depends, um, and and I'll I'll tell you what it takes us. It depends what you're doing. Is it a 2,000 square foot house with siding, or is it a 5,000 square foot house with tile roof, um, hardwood throughout? You know, it might take longer through that process. Also, what's the sub market look like in your in yeah. your area? Um, with us. You know, we're, we're flying if we can do it in 12 months from acquisition to sell. But in some cases, we've been to 18 months. If that takes uh, six months to get it designed and permitted, which sounds crazy, but it's taken that in some cases, and then 12 months to build, and then, you know, maybe it's on the market for three months, and then and somebody falls through or whatever. Anyway, uh, to be safe, it's hard to nail down. I hate to tell you 18 months and it kills the deal because you're paying too much in interest, but let's say that 12 to... 12 month is flying 18 months on the, on the high side. And that's in a good market where the houses are selling quick. Now we're seeing some slowdown here. Do you have any concern about that? Um, we have seen a softening. I'm not concerned about it. I think that's the ebb and flow of real estate. I don't think we're going off a cliff. Um, GDP, national GDP is doing well. Interest rates dropped a little bit. Um, we're in Denver. I, I don't know if everyone's in Denver. In Denver, we're still, ranked in the top real estate, you know, top 20 real estate markets in the country. We're rated as the number two place to live in the country. So for Denver, I, I still feel confident. Also, we're building in Denver. So we feel more insulated than building in the suburbs because we're, we're closer to downtown. So you're flying at 12 months. Should a budget longer than that? Uh, uh, yeah. So that's what you were saying, 18? Yeah, I'd say 18. Yeah. So maybe to, just to be careful, give yourself some time in case it takes a little while to sell it or your contractors aren't showing up like Sean said. Okay, good one. Jennifer Blaine says MLS now or Privy. I don't know if you even know what Privy is. I'm not Have you heard Privy, of that? Blaine? No, just uh, some MLS. You know, we're starting to find deals now in the MLS that work because things are getting a little slower. I think dirt prices are starting to drop a little bit. People are getting more realistic on what they can sell their properties for. Um, up until recently, we never found deals on the MLS. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time it hit the MLS, it was overpriced, but that's starting to change. And my understanding is that Privy pulls the data from the MLS, um, and I think there's maybe some other sources too. Mm. I've heard some good things about it. I don't know that much about it. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. You haven't so even heard of I'll, it yet. I'll look. So Blaine, thank you for pointing that out. I'll have to I'll have to investigate that. Um, but that's a paid that's a paid. I do know that's a paid service, and MLS okay. is free um, with Redfin. Uh, you, you, I think you like Zillow to find properties. We don't yeah, I use Zillow. Zillow to value them, but you do use it to find them, right? Yeah. I'll even look for comps on there. 
because I can do it as a snapshot. If you can dissect the comp, you yeah. don't use the the Zillow value. No, I don't Zillow. use the Z. They call it the Zestimate, I think, or something. Yeah, I don't use the Zestimate, but okay. Do you have an example of a lean waiver you can share with us? And what does it look like? Yeah, absolutely. You know what, Lisa? You could, if you Google that, um, you could buy the lean waiver stamps. It's pretty standard language, but if you want to email me, I'll just take my stamp and stamp a blank sheet of paper and scan it and send it to you so you can see exactly what it says. Um, so my email is uh, kevin at pinefinancialgroup.com and I'll get you the exact language that I use. Are you? Would you be open to sharing what? Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, send me that email and I'll make sure, unless you want okay, to share your email. I can share my email. It's Sean, S-H-A-W-N, Sean at DublinDevelopment.com. Dublin Development is one word. Um, and maybe when we get this for the recording, when it goes up on YouTube, maybe we'll each get in there and just put our email addresses in the comments so sure. that you can uh, you can email us and get that information. Uh, fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. doing well. Uh, I know some of you might be leaving. We're going way over at 637, but man, we still have over 50 people. Um, so let's keep going. We've got a few more here. Uh, my husband and I are young parents in our 20s. Oh, good job, guys. I started, we both started pretty young too. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, we are fascinated with getting started in real estate and find ourselves gun shy with getting started and honestly get overwhelmed with knowing where to start. Yeah, I think that's pretty common. We could both speak to that. What would you or what would your advice be on those of us who are newbies but maybe unsure exactly where to start? Caitlin, great question. Um, you want to start? You want me? No, you go ahead. Uh, get with your local real estate group and go to all the functions. Go to the meetups, read voraciously, learn everything you can because that is what's going to help with your success is what the knowledge you're learning now prior to diving in into a project and you didn't know was a good or bad project. Um, you might start off as once you can identify deals and maybe you don't have the knowledge and ability to execute and you don't have the money, you can become a wholesaler and you're still finding great deals. And, and as you're learning, you, you, you find people with more experience and you put a small margin on it and you start building money that way. Um, also get your real estate license. If you can, it's a tall order as young parents with kids or young, excuse me, young adults with, with young children. Um, your life is probably crazy right now, but if you can learn the fundamentals of the real estate laws in your area, that's a great way to get, get your foot in the door knowledge wise. That's good advice, especially since there are a couple that want to do it together. One mm -hmm. have it, one not. That way you have the advantages and you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to having your license. So you would have both if you have one got it. So I, I think that's great yeah. advice, Sean. Okay. Um, I guess what I would, the way I would answer that is I'm not going to be nearly as technical as Sean answered it. I think it's hard to top what he just said. Um, so my advice would be the first step really is, and this is going to sound cheesy and maybe it is, but I think you got to figure out why you want to be in real estate to begin with. If, if you can get that fire in your belly, you will not fail. You cannot fail if that why is so strong. So maybe it's the the, maybe it's your babies or your baby. I'm not sure how many kids you said you had, but um, gosh, if you put a picture, I, I have my kids on my coffee mug. I drink out of every single morning. Uh, actually, I have two coffee mugs, one, one for the house, one for the office with my babies on it. And I just, it creates that fire. You know, I, I want to provide. Um, so I think if you can get there and then do the technical advice that Sean gave you, um, you can't, you can't lose. Anything else on that one? That was a that's a good question for a lot of That's a great question. That's one of the best questions of the night, how to get started. Because there's a lot of people who would love to get this and have so much potential, but where do you start? I'm going to just add one part to that. I've said it earlier. Um, if you want it, then do it. There's no, don't wait till tomorrow. Don't put it off. I know a lot of people that five years later are saying, well, I'm, I would have liked to have gotten real estate. Do it. Doesn't it's okay matter. to fail. It's okay to fail. doesn't matter how old you are. Believe in yourself and do it and go. And next thing you know, you look back and say, wow, I've been doing this for 10 years and we're building condo buildings. What a blessing. This has been a great ride. Um, Caitlin, I, I love the question. Good luck. Email us if you have yeah, more, some more questions. Help you. Yeah. Um, oh, cool. Tony's still with All us. All right, Tony. Uh, be careful. Each state may have different rule for lien waivers from what my attorney told me. You're right. Okay, do. that's good. Yep. That's good. Yep. They do, Tony. So I'm glad you brought that up. So the two states that we work in are very similar. So I didn't even that didn't even register with me. But yeah, that's probably true. And I would uh, run it by I would go to the title company, or title company first if the state uses title companies.
because you can get that advice for free. And then I would go to an attorney if uh, if the title company is not going to provide yeah. the lien waiver information for you. Thank you for pointing that out, Tony. You're right. Um, okay, my husband and I are. Oh, we already went through that one. Okay, off, off topic. topic. This looks like it might be the last one, guys. So ask some more questions if you want. We'll answer those last one. Last one. Jefferson Park area land for sale for high rise condo building. Looking for buyer, <laughs> except for Ladon said that and then left. So I don't know how we get information on the project because you left. But hey, if you come back and listen to the uh, the presentation tonight on our YouTube channel, then leave us a comment on more information about that. We'll take a look at it. Yeah, uh, I know Sean for sure will. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, you and I are going to go have a, a beer and we're going to go have a little sushi. Um, so unless there's anything else, we're going to sign off. We'll wait here just a second. There's still How many people? Right. There's 45 people. 40, That's great, guys. Thank you. 45 people. Um, this is a rare, in fact, this is the first time he said he was a, a virgin. Yeah, it's my first uh, webinar, everyone. So thank you for, for so, attending. Yeah. So this isn't something that we could just do all the time. He's very busy. So if you have questions for Sean, this is the time to ask. All right, good. We're starting to get some things. How do you get to the wholesalers? Email Justin for the wholesaler list. Justin, it's uh, Justin at pinefinancialgroup.com. Tell him Kevin said email me for a wholesaler list. Blaine, have you used the National Guru Bootcamp event? I have not. I'm not familiar with that. Kevin, do you know that? Uh, National Guru? Uh, I don't. I don't know. But here's what I will say sounds about good. National Gurus. It sounds like this is a specific one, but any national guru I'd be pretty careful with. Um, I think you can get a tremendous amount of value and it could help propel you forward. And I think you're gonna pay a lot for it. So mm -hmm. I know there's local mentors that you pay a fee and they walk you through projects um, in the markets that we work in. You could probably find local mentors in any market, I would think. So go to your RIAs and you pay a lot less and you get a lot more handholding from people that know your market. So I would, right. that would be my suggestion on that one. <clears throat> All right, where seems like more coming in now, huh? Um, how do you vet the wholesalers? Oh, mm. sorry, how do you vet the wholesalers? You don't. So what you want to do is be on as many wholesaler distribution lists as possible. Maybe I should let you answer this. Yeah. Okay. So wholesalers out there, um, I, I don't want to ruffle your feathers, but I've got it for a minute. Um, there's a lot of people trying to wholesale that might not know what they're doing. So they're going to advertise a property to you, a property to you. They're going to give an example of the best comp they found two years ago, a mile away, and they're going to put a $40,000 fee on it. Um, the, how you vet them is if the deal pencils and you'll know Bingo. really quick. So there's a lot of great wholesalers out there and they're bird dogs. They know how to find a deal. They're not trying to get rich on you. Maybe they put a $5,000 on it, but they know you're going to buy five a month from them. Uh, or, or whatever the case may be, but um, no matter what a wholesaler sends you, you have to you have to do your own research. You have to check all the comps yourself because that's on you once you sign on the loan. You can't you can't put it on the on the wholesaler. So a lot of great wholesalers out there, but there's a lot of new wholesalers that are trying to you know tack on a big fee and they're going to give you to justify the best comp they found from two years ago, a mile down the road. Um, that's not a comp. So yeah, my, one of my clients, one of our clients just did that. So uh, bought into their comps, bought in, yeah, $10,000 yeah. down. We can't fund it cause we don't want to fund bad deals. Yeah. So wholesalers out there, uh, um, uh, sorry, sorry. There's some of you that are great and some that just please be honest with your client because you got to protect and defend your client. Cause if you get a good client who believes in you and knows you find good deals, you could have a 20 year relationship and they'll buy five a month from you. I we'd buy five a month from you if you brought us solid deals at pencils. Um, okay, so that's a great answer. My simple answer would have been you don't bet them. You don't bet them. You bet the deals. Okay, where are we at now? Okay, good. Do you have a wholesale list for DC or Northern? Uh, you know, we were doing some business. Oh, Linda, you're from DC. Okay, so we were doing quite a bit of business out there. We had a hedge fund backing us. We didn't want to put any of our money outside of our two markets. And so we were pretty entrenched out there. Um, and then our hedge fund decided that they didn't want to put their money in DC anymore. So we, we ended up pulling out and that's why we have so many DC and Baltimore and Maryland, all these, um, um, followers from that area because we were doing business there. Unfortunately, Linda, I do not have any wholesalers 
in that area, but I would suggest doing some networking on bigger pockets for that. Mm -hmm. So it's biggerpockets.com. Sorry, I couldn't be more help there. Uh, Sean spells the same way you do. Hey, Sean. Uh, how do you do, or how, how sorry, do you deal with the building department and the requirements they may stipulate zoning planning? Great question. Thanks for reading that for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I saw Sean. <laughs> no, there, you're so. good. <laughs> um, so Sean, great question. This is a tough one. Um, <laughs> you, you're dealing with the public sector that doesn't want to jump on issues and, and give you the best customer service. Sometimes the best thing to do is be very organized, be very polite and stay in front of them. Um, no, learn your zoning, your local zoning. If you're in Denver, you know, get on there, learn the zoning. And frankly, for anybody, even if you're not doing real estate development, Sean, sounds like you're doing real estate development with this question. Um, become an, a wizard, become a wizard in your area. Know the streets, know, learn the zoning, uh, know comps, become an expert in your area. And that goes with zoning and planning and, and going down there and, and introducing yourself to people and interacting. It's a tough one, Sean. Um, but that that's where we found success is being organized, honest, polite, stay in front of them. All right, let's keep going here because we're, this is probably our longest webinar ever. Um, sorry guys, but thanks for hanging with us. I live in Northern Virginia area and want to house hack, but it's very hard to find a duplex in Arlington DC market. She suggests investing in a condo, with two bedrooms. Um, okay. For a year and rent it out, rent to roommates. So, okay, so what she's asking here is house hacking is this, this term coined in the bigger pockets community. And what they're talking about is, I don't know if you've heard this mm. before, but um, so you buy a property, you move somebody in, whether it's a duplex, you move them into the other unit. If it's a threeplex, you move someone in the other two units, or if it's just a house and you move somebody into your bedroom. And what the idea is here is it's that they're gonna help you pay your mortgage for you. So it's just roommates basically. Okay. And, then, and then you can create, uh, income that way and then move into bigger projects or more rentals. Great. So her, like her question is, if I'm gonna house hack a duplex, I'm gonna buy it as an owner occupant, live in one, rent out the other. So that's what she's saying here. And she's having trouble with that. So then she says, what other suggestions would you have? Um, so I could say how I got started. You don't have much in the way of rental properties. Right. That's not his business model. So the house hack, that's why he, I knew he didn't hear of this uh, strategy before. Um, so for me, when I got started, I did, I just bought a house and I rented out the two extra rooms. Um, and then I, and then I moved out of that and bought another house and I rented out those extra rooms. So if you're using owner occupied financing, it's the best financing out there. It doesn't have to be a duplex. It could be anything if you can get in some roommates. Um, and I have a really close friend, you know, him, Matt Pilmore has a fantastic YouTube channel, also VIP financial. Um, he, he got a roommate offline. And they ended up becoming like best friends. Mm. So that's a very interesting house hack there where he ended up creating this lifelong relationship. Um, so I don't know if that, if that answers your question, but I want to get married to the idea of a duplex. There's so many other options out there. You suggested a condo. Yes, a condo is one of those options that you should, could and should be looking at. Um, what's the ROI you use as a benchmark? So the return on investment, that's a good question. And there's different ways to look at it. So you're looking at it from passive investor, investing in, in a, a, our team um, or what we would look for a return. Um, from a net profit margin in a percentage, we look at a 12 to 18% is what we shoot for as a net profit on a deal. Sometimes it's higher. Um, Kevin, as an ROI, as an investor, what would, what would you or what would uh, your team or your fund look for? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, ours is so different. Like if I'm looking for my own investment, I'm going to be looking at so much more than ROI. ROI is such, it's so narrow focused. There's like so much more, right? How much effort am I going to put into it? How much risk am I mm -hmm. taking? Who are my partners in the deal? Because that, and then you, you, depending on who you're working with, you may want to lower or increase your ROI. Um, so I think it's much bigger picture to look at that. Um, for, for my fund, we pay, you know, it's a, it's a flat 8% that we pay. We could take investors from Minnesota and from Colorado. Um, and this is going to be all secured, real secure uh, money. That, and we're going to promise the 8% return. This is a public fund that was approved by the SEC. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily what everybody wants. You know, an 8% is good. It's a good, solid return, but it's not the fix and flip numbers like you're talking right. about. Um, so I think that's, that's a great question that is almost impossible to answer 
because everyone's situation is different. Everybody's, the, the variables are so different. Um, but if you're looking at a deal, Sean, what are, you, what are you looking for as far as profit or how do you know it's a deal you want to buy? Maybe we can answer it that way. Wow. That's a good question. Sometimes it goes back to what Ke Kevin's saying, like, what's the effort for? Is it, is it a flip? Is it a scrape in an amazing neighborhood and we got, got a great price? Is it a really tough, long three-year condo project? So what's that net? Is it just a pure dollar amount? Are we going to make $2 million on a deal or is it a percentage? Uh, it's hard to nail down, but I'll, I'll tell you on a single family, if we can look at a deal and we're at a, you know, 12% might be low, maybe we get 18% in some cases into the low 20s as a net profit margin, if that's a deal for us. And then you finance that so your your uh, return on investment is through the roof. Oh, through the roof, yeah. And that was what I was going to ask uh, with yeah, Linda. Like, is, if you're matters. using cash, so you're going to put 30% down of your uh, total cost, total total uh, construction or total build costs, project costs, excuse me, um, and get 70% from the bank. And, you know, what is your return on your investment, on your 30% you put down? Um, you could probably double that if you're doing a deal yourself. I don't know. It, that's a yeah. hard one to answer. Yeah, that's a real tough one. Um, hopefully, Linda, we helped you with that. If not, ask, if not, email us. Yeah, or or yeah, that's a good one. So we probably should be finishing up here, even though there's still 33 of you with us. That's awesome, guys. Thank you. Okay. Um, scenario. Oh, oh no. You want to read that one? Yeah. Scenario. I've done about five flips now. I'm a teacher, relatively cash poor. My mom is needing to sell her property. Would be a great turning uh, the house into a duplex and adding an eightplex. Uh, how do I make this happen? What steps would you suggest? So let me understand that mom's house turned into a uh, turning into a duplex. Since this one is so specific, Sean, would you be okay answering this offline? Yeah, totally. Seth, email me Sean S H A W N at Dublin Development. Uh, Dublin, like Dublin, Ireland. Yeah, Dublin, and then Dublin. you guys can connect. I know Sean's got such a big, he's busy, but he's got a real big heart yeah. and he'll, he'll yeah, please help reach you out that. to me, Seth. And, and God bless you as a teacher and uh, and also doing real estate. Yeah, and that's it. The last one is thank you. So awesome. I think we're going to wrap this up. Awesome, guys. We're going to go have a thank beer, you. have some sushi. I appreciate you for coming, listening to the presentation. I appreciate you for listening to the recording. Um, be sure to check us out, pinefinancialgroup.com. Have a great night. It's still going.